June 21st, the year of our Lord 2015. Today is the Father's Day, and I hope you enjoy or have a plan to enjoy today in celebrating Father's Day and honoring your fathers or your families, your parents. Just happy, happy Father's Day to all of you. Father's Day or Mother's Day, those days are the day to celebrate the joy, the blessing, the relationship, especially family relationship. But it doesn't stay there. It expands to friends and relatives, of course, for children and parents' relationship. And you have to understand that healthy family, healthy relationship, it's not just at that level. Because family is a, it's a germ cell of society. Okay? Let me say it again. Families are germ cells of society. So healthy family, healthy relationship make healthy family. Healthy family make healthy society. Healthy society make healthy nation. Healthy nations and healthy nations make healthy global, healthy globe, healthy world, a place to live in peace, enjoy the blessing. On the contrary, if we have unhealthy relationship, we have unhealthy family. Unhealthy family, we have unhealthy society. We have unhealthy societies. When we have unhealthy society, we have unhealthy nation. I know maybe some of us or some of you don't care about nation. Well, I'm not care about nation. I'm, I care about my skateboard. I care about my game. I care about my texting. I care, I care about my surfboard. I care about my new band shoes or whatnot. But Sooner or later, you understand what I'm talking about. The reason you have your van shoes because all of those things that I mentioned are healthy. Nation, which provides peace and blessing to the whole country and to our society and to our family and to us. common sense, and healthy nations, all healthy nations, we have a healthy world. You may or may not understand or care to understand the effect of the global, not global warming, the global unstable and global hatred and war, which costs all of us sooner or later will cost Nations and nation to break down in wars and and death. And when nation break down and to fall into those traps, make the society, our society, and eventually to our families. And when it hit your families, you may or may not care for your family because you I don't know where you stand in your family. Because not all families are, the, not all families are in the position or in the circumstance or situation that you're so happy to hear the word family, such as father, mothers, or fathers, or husbands, or wives, or, or children, because your family might have been broken down and destroyed long gone. There's no joys, no joy, no value. Nothing thrill about family. On the contrary, it's bitterness and pain. Let alone to say Happy Father's Day. I hate my dad. Uh, happy Mother's Day. I hate my mom. And she's a you know bling bling. I heard people say that about their mom. And they heard about they say about their dad. He's a bling bling. No bling bling, but bling bling. Some of us are noble enough not to say that. Because they say, oh, that's too low to say that about parents. 
You think you're better? Not much. Because you may or may not say all of those or express anger, bitter, and rudeness, but you show no respect, no love, no obedience, no commitment, no sacrifice for one another, whether to parents or to children, whether to father or to mother or to wife or husband or whatnot. Without that, of course, you may not have to go and slap in the face or cuss at them or do bad things, but lack of respect, lack of love, lack of relationship, lack of all of that, you are no different in just killing each other off. And that doesn't mean, okay, then the pastor <laughs> says that I have the license to go kill them. I'm just hating them. Then why not? It's not that either. That's only proof your bitterness and evilness in your heart, in your nature. So Father's days mean nothing if you don't really truly mean happy Father's Day or happy Mother's Day. Unfortunately, we live in a society so big on good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Love you. Love you. And all of that. Happy birthday. Happy Memorial Day. I'm not so happy about that. Huh? I'm just kidding. A lot of happy Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, Happy Thanksgiving. A lot of happy, 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 happy. Happy go lucky. But do you really happy? Do you really wish that it was just a, some trap that you're in saying without meaning? Be careful. I'm not against happy Father's Day. I'm not against happy wishing each other culturally, but I want us to be real about what we're talking about. I want us to be real about who we are. Do we really, honestly, sincerely, and manly, I don't mean you're a girl, you have to be manly, man. I'm talking about do we maturely mean what we say, or are we just no clue? Or are we a person who lack of integrity? Whatever we say, we do. What we say, different from what we do. What we do, different from what we think. Are we a man of character, or woman, or child, or whatever? Uh, when I say man, I don't mean masculinity. I mean a person, a humanity, a human. That we mean what we say, and we say what we mean. Do you have character, or we don't? The reason we don't have all of this, we, I'm talking about in general, and I'm not talking about we here, have this superficial because we are not real. <laughs> we fake every day. Why? Because our society, our culture, our family, our nation, and the globe, and the, and the world is li it, are living in the decaying death process right now. We are dying. I was uh, figured out. We all know that. No, more than that, we are dying inside our soul and our mind and nature while we're still breathing. That's worse. Why is that? Why is a broken relationship all over the place? I'm not here to preach social gospel. I'm not here to give 14 steps to have a very healthy family. I'm not talking about, although I'm not against that, I'm going deeper than that. I go to the root of what is the decaying process that eating up? What is the cancer cell in our human society? What is the death, uh, the, the cancer cell or the deadly disease that eating up our not nation, not, not international, but, but, but society more than that? Our family, our own family. Do you see something in your family that it could have been better or something that you could have been up to sit from where it is? We ought to realize that because eventually we set a death trap to not only our family, not only society, not only our nation, not only the world, but ourselves. Do not just go and say, Happy Father's Day, you don't mean it. And then you don't, then I, uh, my, I can just imagine some of my kids saying, then I won't say it. 
That's not what it meant. Should I say your name? No. That's not what it meant. It's supposed to be change your attitude. Change your thinking. Wake up. Yeah, wake up. Get better. You need to change your spirit, your heart, your attitude toward this. Supposedly, culturally, politely loving one another. Not only you to parents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking to one another. Parents to children, children to children, siblings to siblings, friends and families and brothers and stranger. We need to do that. Why we live in a broken society? We are family, and this family, this family I'm talking about, family in general, are unhealthy, make society unhealthy. Families are germs of society. If a family is bad, the society is bad. And then I turn around, if the society as a whole is bad, make your families bad. You cannot avoid that because you are part of the society. If the society is bad, you're bad. Corrupt and destroy. But if you are corrupted and destroyed, you make the society bad. It go back and forth. So we live in a trap world. We live in a closed system that poison waiting to just totally burn down completely. And what says this to us, you and I, individual, we are one. We are the microscopic element inside that germ cell, which is inside the family, which is the part of building up the whole body as a society in itself. Why? Of course, you said sin. Of course, that's right. And what specifically, what sin is this? Do we do something wrong? Obviously, we do something wrong, but I go further than doing something wrong. Somebody not even doing anything wrong, but still contribute to that society, that family, that world, decaying process. If you do something to hurt your body, of course, you kill yourself. And you're not doing anything to yourself, of course, you're doing something bad to yourself as well. Either do something wrong or don't do anything right, they're both equal. They're both evil. They're both equally evil. We miss something in the, the element of the healthy society. Very simple. Very simple. The two most important elements or ingredients to the healthy family, healthy society, healthy world are love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness must go together. Why I have forgiveness and repentance. That's a title of the passage. This is introduction. We must have love. We must have forgiveness. We cannot have one or the other. Those two are the most important elements in every relationship. Every relationship. Whether you with yourself, you say, oh, I have a relationship. Yes, obviously, some of you, some of us, some of people cannot even live with themselves because they're turmoil. They're in turmoil. They're in confused. They're in a deadly decaying process in themselves. Nobody needs to do anything to them. They do something to themselves. Or the time just waiting to die, go lower and lower, diminish and disqualify themselves to the point of completely trash. That already missing. Say, oh, then the pastor teaches, oh, go and forgive yourself. Go and love yourself. I'm not talking about that. A lot of uh, preaching, a lot of teaching, a lot of philosophy say, oh, Jesus loves you. Why can't you love yourself? Oh, so philosophizing, so, oh, so profound, it's so deep. God forgive you. Can you forgive yourself? There's nothing to forgive yourself about. You need to. Yeah, never mind. We need to understand, I'm talking about the relationship, true relationship, <coughs> true healthy relationship, whether with God, with one another, with families, our own families, and family to family, society, and the church, and a, and a nation, and so on. Missing those two things, forgiveness and love. In our context today, in our present in a moment that God moved us to the point that we look at Matthew 18, 21, 22, we look at one of those two elements which is important. 
Very important. I entitled it Forgiveness and Repentance. I'm sure you noticed that earlier. I apologize. Can you go back to the title real quickly? Repentance and for, uh, forgiveness and repentance. Most people, especially quote unquote religious or spiritual people, they focus, they look at the whole thing, they see only one word, forgiveness. They do not see the word repentance. They look at the whole thing as one word only, forgiveness. What you're talking about, or what we're talking about today was about forgiveness. I must go and forgive. Oh, yes, feel good to forgive. The moment you forgive, the poison release, and you no longer, you hold no grudge, and you're therefore the most happiness life in the world. Ooh, sound profound, sound pro, pro, philosophical, deep. However, it's script, scripturally incorrect. This is not how God view forgiveness. God, view, God views forgiveness never apart from repentance. Biblical repentance, I'm sorry, biblical forgiveness never without repentance. Repentance. And repentance, biblical repentance never without forgiveness either. We shall see. Today we focus on forgiveness. At this point, Peter went to the Lord and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? The point is, how often will I forgive my brother when they sin against me? It's phrased that way. And Peter offered the, what he sincerely, wholeheartedly believed this is the best answer, Lord, because forgive one another one time is good enough. And the um, rabbinic and cultural tradition to say that um, and when scripture teaches forgive him three times but I went further to this seven times three times time three and add one more am I good I'm not putting him down I'm with him I'm not even I'm not even anywhere close to Apostle Peter to forgive seven times I probably hardly can ever Paul myself to forgive one time, so I, I, I salute him. However, Jesus answered to him, no, 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 not seven times, seven times, 70. What's that mean? It doesn't mean Jesus have you have a, this notebook with a pen, um, put forgive one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, until 489 and 190, that's it. You're dead. <laughs> no, it's not that. The point here, the contact here, Jesus is talking about you forgive those who sin against you without negative, holding grudge, attitude. You must forgive sincerely and hopefully and lovingly. You must forgive them with a pure heart. Not forgive them and then holding on. And I'll wait until you next time. Uh -huh. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. A story about a man I heard from pastor's illustration. I like it a lot. A man got married and then took his wife on a horse riding, I mean, on a, on a cart pulled by the horse, you know, and just, just married and, and, and the can and all the stuff uh, hanging behind the cart and everybody waved, good luck. <laughs> and then they went on the countryside. Go for a ride with a new bride. And the man just riding the cart, and then the horse bump into something, and it just jerked the cart. And say, uh, that's one. Mm -hmm. And then next one, bum again. and said, that's two times. And the wife said, hmm, my husband kind of very manly. Yes, manly I am. And the third time, boom, three times, that's it. He jumped out of the car and pulled his gun and shoot the horse. Three times, bang. I give you three times. After that, that's it. Or maybe three times and the fourth time, dead. And she said, man, three times dead? Who oh my God, into this man. Because this forgiveness is counting to see you wrong again. Jesus is talking about forgiveness with no evil attitude. 
Forgive, this forgiveness is different. Of course, forgiving someone, like I said, forgiving is loving are the two things go together. Forgive those who love those who offend us. Jesus even teaches us a lot further. I'm sure it comes to your mind as to love your enemy, forgive your enemy. Of course, yes, that's what it is. Matthew chapter 5, 44, 45. You love your enemy, you forgive your enemy. There's no greater characteristic in loving and forgiving others, even to the enemies, like your Father in heaven. There's no characteristic close to God such as these two elements. You can be whatever, but when you get to the point of to love your enemy, to forgive your enemy, you display your nature, which is true nature, that belongs to your Father in heaven. You're more like your Father. You be more like your Father in heaven because you forgive them, you love them. So, this is not something you go and crank out, crank up and work out. No, this is something that God already has given it to you in your nature already since you became a Christian. But today, we'll let's focus on the word forgiveness, to forgive. How many times should I forgive? And we understand we must forgive. And forgive with, with such attitude of no holding grudge. True forgiveness, sincere forgiveness. Okay, let's look at that. And must understand this. Not so much of, of course it is, to, embed, to better our life, our society, our family, our nation, and whatnot. That is true. But more importantly, forgiveness or forgiving is a command from God. See? Yes, it is important to us. Yes, it's beneficial to all of us. But that is secondary. Blessing to mankind is secondary. I said again, blessing to us is secondary. Blessing to children of God is secondary. Blessing to Christians is secondary. is not the most important. The most important is our life. If you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. Our life is to seek every opportunity to honor the Father in heaven. That's our life. More like the Father, you want to honor God because it's a command of God, and you obey His commandment, you honoring Him. Of course, when you obey Him, you get the blessing as well. It go both ways, but most important, honoring God. Now let's look at forgiveness. Forgiveness, however, it could be deadly if you handle it wrongly. I said again, really, really. Even forgiveness, something so harmless, something so not only, no, it sounds harmless, but something so beautiful, so peaceful, so nice, so calm and cool and no war. It could be deadly. Yes, so it's cancer. Cancer is very deadly, very quiet, but deadly. A loud bang of explosive cartridge Leaving your gun barrel can deadly kill someone. Of course, the bang, the hitting of the cars, mass crash to another. Of course, the bomb. Of course, all of those signify deadly result. That's no different from cancers that eating quietly. There was an old song long time ago when I was a child called "The Sound of Silence" by Garfield. Garfield and my race. Simon Garfunkel. Yes, Garfield. Oh, yeah, I get Garfield. Simon Garfunkel. The sound of silence. Going silent like a cancer. Whoa. I have used to love that song, but I listened to it. It's like, whoa. Killing like a cancer. That's not nice. But point is, cancer, though it's quiet, can kill. Not can kill, will kill. Yes. Mishandling and scripturally forgiving can be deadly as a loud, violent, 
sinful action as well. Both deadly. Can be deadly. More than deadly, let me surprise something. Maybe you never thought of forgiving could be this bad. It is when you mishandling it, when you do it outside the biblical principle, the command of God. It can be more than deadly. It is idolatry. Whoa, where are you getting from? Yes, that means God commands us to honor him, to obey him, to forgive one another, and so on and so on, in his way. And we made up our own rule better than God to forgive others outside of God's counsel because this is your religion now. God forgive this way. I forgive better than God. I hear a lot of people say, I forgive. I forgive. I don't know what he or she do, what I do, it's their problem, but I forgive, I'm free. God didn't forgive you, I forgive you. Whoa, idolatry. You make your own religion by forgiving wrongly. Forgiving, forgiveness has to be scripturally correct. Has to obey God, the Spirit of God in the Bible. Otherwise, not only deadly to yourself, but deadly to individuals that whom to whom you forgive. Because you give them a license. You'll forgive them, give them a license while there's no correction. And then you elevate yourself greater than God because you forgive no matter what. And you quasi you you, 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 you abuse the Bible, abuse Christianity. You're quasi-forgiving them better than God, make you better than God. Who's the God now? It's you. It's a man-made religion. It's a self-centered religion. It's a self-centered doctrine to forgive others no matter what outside of God's counsel. So it could be deadly. Well, not everybody intends to do that, but a lot of people do that. So forgiveness can come up in three options in our life. Okay? There's a lot of number. Love and forgiveness, forgiveness and repentance, and, and all of this. And now we have um, a forgiveness is uh, it's important for our lives. It's good for us. But number two, which is better, is to honor God. A lot of number. If you can get all those numbers, great. If you don't, get the main point. But now go to another formula. Numbers, again. My mind worked that way. I, I like to keep point, main point, sub point, sub sub point, sub 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 point, sub sub point. I have all of that laying out. That's how I think. But if you don't think that way, it's okay. Okay? Just trying to Get what you can to apply from the Bible, from the scripture, and, and, and apply to obey. Now, three options come out from the concept of forgiveness. One, two, three. Good, thank you. One, you can forgive each other the way Jesus or the Bible teaches. We can forgive each other scripturally, put it that way. We can forgive each other the correct way according to the Bible, according to Jesus, according to the whole doctrine. Forgive each other according to God's way, God's doctrine, God's teaching. That's number one. Obviously, it sounds right. It is right. Number two, we can also forgive the way we want to forgive. The way we want to forgive is a lot easy because we don't need to know much. We don't need to do anything. We don't need, it's just whether, whenever it's easy, we do it. Whenever we feel good, we do it. So forgiving people my way, I do it my way. <laughs> anything I did right and wrong, but I'm proud of it. I did it my way. Yep. Frank, you do it your way. Do it God's way, do it your way. Oh, thirdly, another one which most of us practice. What do we do with forgiveness? We don't do anything about it. We crush it. I don't want to forgive. 
Even if I politely, culturally say I forgive you, but I don't forgive you, I don't care, I don't want to forgive you, I condemn you. So we have three things, options to deal with forgiveness in our life. And I'm not talking about forgive yourself, okay? You don't need to forgive yourself. You need to repent. You need God to forgive you. You need those who you wrong forgive you. No, you don't need to forgive yourself. He said, so what do I do? I kick myself in the back. Maybe so. But you don't, you don't have the right. You don't have the privilege. You don't have the authority to forgive yourself. You have no place to forgive yourself. You need to repent and step. You need to repair, repent, and repair, restore what you're wrong done. Okay, let's go back to biblical preaching, uh, teaching, uh, not uh, human standard here. Number three is easy to understand. Third point is not to forgive. Everyone understand that. We do well in that. Number one and number two could be very difficult to understand those two. Number one, though it's hard, though it's not that easy, but we can find a way to find out which way is the right way to do. Number two, it's very tricky because we trick ourselves. We man man manipulate the situation, our thinking, to say, to do what we do, forgive them outside of the Bible teaching, and we think we do it right. That's very confusing. That's very tricky. That's very, very uh, I was going to say, that's very complex. Yeah, that's complex. It couldn't come out. That's very complex, so it's very sophisticated and tricky to make ourselves look good, but actually we are doing something deadly. Okay? Now, to go to number one, to know what the Bible teaches in forgiving, answer not only number one, but we'll answer number two as well, because we know what's right, so we know what's wrong not to do. Not to do. So that's what we're, talk, uh, we're coming at right now. Forgiveness or forgiving according to the Holy Scripture is the only way for us to do it right. It's the only way to us for to avoid the second one. And the only way for us to not do the third one. Make a lot of sense, right? Yes, thank you. I do think so. Now, how do we know then how to forgive according to God's pleasure and God's ways and God's instruction? And again, this is not a 14 step how to forgive. It's not okay philosophizing as uh, you forgive, number one, you must forgive yourself. Number one, you have to go in deep and reach out why it hurt. Oh, yes. You need to do that. You have to understand, you need to understand, and you need to forgive because what? No, 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 no. To understand this, the only way to understand, not that you cannot think, but better than thinking about all of that, you need to understand what the Holy Scripture teaches. What the Holy Spirit teaches, what our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, teaches about forgiveness. That's the only way and the way, the best way and only way, there's no other way to forgive correctly. I have to give a footnote here. This is not something that we can toss to everyone in the world because this is not designed for the world that's designed for those who are called by God only. God not prejudice, but God preserve the value of his holiness, of his holy scripture, of his low, holy name, his holy teaching for his children only. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? You want to keep the pure, purity of your, your spouse or your children to your family your wife to yourself, your husband to yourself, not the world. You don't. You, you don't do that. And God has a right to keep this purity in his family. He's not greedy. Okay? Therefore, those who are children of God logically speaking, can eventually know how to honor God, know how to forgive correctly. Why? Because God teaches them through the Holy Spirit, through the Bible. The rest, no understanding any of that. 
Even if they do understand, they would not want to do that. Even if they want to do that, they would not be able to do that. You understand that? Three level. They don't know. If they know they don't want to do it, if they want to do it, they can't do it. Because they're not ch God children. But for you, God children, you have the privilege the relationship, the intimate relationship with God, and the privilege to receive the blessing from God. The privilege to receive the Holy Scripture, the privilege to receive the power to do it. Paul said this to the believer in, in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm going to pick two points through because we're not preaching on that passage. This is only to support that God Give to you and not to everyone. God will not cheapen his holy scripture to dogs and to pigs. That's the Bible said. Oh, you call them dogs and pigs? No, Jesus called them dogs and pigs. Very simple. Yet among the, the mature, we do impart wisdom. The wisdom from God is not the wisdom from this age. We're serving a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Talk about the gospel from start from the start of the gospel and the rest of the doctrine is from God, the wisdom from God, of course. And verse eight, none of the rulers of this age understand understood it, understood this. Meaning it doesn't matter whether you're a commoner or a great man, um, a, a secular great man, whether educationally or financially or military or um, politically. No matter who you are, how great you are, the rulers and what kind, financially or military or uh, politics uh, in a country, in a nation, what not, you cannot, you cannot understand the wisdom of God because it's not for you to understand, even if you try. But for you, Christian, the Lord impart his knowledge, his wisdom his, from him through the Holy Spirit, through the Scripture, through the servant of God, and through your own study, the Word as well, so that you can understand. You can grow. And you can function as God desire for you to function, including forgiveness. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Otherwise, you, you trap yourself or that person you're supposed to forgive in a deadly trap. Verse 9, this is not something we can imagine or come up with on our own. Something that God revealed, God prepared for those who love him. See, for you who love God only. You know, there's the, uh, the, uh, a design or a, uh, a jacket that says members only. This is God's members only. God's children only. God prepared this for you who love God only. Verse 10, God has revealed to us through the Holy Spirit, of course, and through the Scripture, of course, we read the Scripture. What is it that he, the wisdom of God, the depths of God, the treasure in him? Now, verse 12, now we have received the Spirit, not the Spirit of the Word, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the thing freely given to us by God. See, we receive this, receive this scripture, understanding, but most of all, we receive the Holy Spirit. So we understand what God thinking. Verse 13, we import this in words, in scriptures, the wisdom taught by the Holy Spirit. We have all of this. So in this context, you and I can easily Sometimes not that easily, but possibly, I should say, the concept, the biblical teaching, the godly, correct way to forgive, to forgive. Otherwise, we can't forgive. We don't want to forgive. Otherwise, we forgive in the wrong way, which is deadly to, to the person whom we forgive and to ourselves and become idolatry. This is the best way. This is the right way. The only way is to forgive according to the scripture. Now, go back to Matthew 18 again. The concept is Peter asks, should I forgive 
I should forgive. <laughs> By the way, I should forgive maybe, Lord. Yeah. Uh, should I forgive one time? Three? I should forgive seven times. Am I good? This is not good enough, basically. You should forgive more than that, and you should forgive with the attitude not counting down, not keeping track of black book. So you should forgive. Yes, you should forgive with this right attitude. Right attitude. Okay? You should do that. But more important, it's a commandment from God. Jesus commands us to forgive. All right? We look at this direction from divine perspective than human perspective. The sixth way how to forgive Six way to live a better life. Six way to take the poison, the toxic, the acid out of your mind, the heart because you don't forgive. So it's not about that. It's about this is commandment of God from God. This is something we must obey. Therefore, we must forgive. Because if we do this, we obey Him, we honor Him. Of course, the result all of that as well. Forgive by obedient in obedient heart. Forgive in the right spirit. Remember. Forgiving the wrong way, forgiving not in a scriptural way, we stand against God's face. Why is that? How is that? Because if God doesn't forgive that person, and we said, you're not good enough, God, even though you don't forgive that person, I will forgive him for you. If God didn't love you, I love you. I heard this when we were kids. God love you, so I do. Say that to a girl. <laughs> want to tell her that. Uh, uh, scared to death to tell somebody you love it, you go use God first. God love you, and so I do. So do I. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why don't you just drop the God? How <laughs> you fear to be you get rejected, so you use Jesus, right? Yeah. So we must do it the right way, the right attitude, the right attitude. And every time we talk about forgive someone, we think about oh. More than forgive someone, you must love your enemy. Fine. That's good. Talk about that. Matthew 5, 44, 45, talking about love your enemy. And there's no greater, again, godly character like God, our Father in heaven, when we forgive and when we love our enemy. Because God does that. If you are children of God, which you are, you naturally now, before you maybe not, but now you naturally forgive and love your enemy as well. There's no greater character that close to God that you may be son of your father who is in heaven because you forgive your enemy. You love your enemy. That's the farthest people can go. The first one is they love your enemy. That's it. Oh, no, just love, just be, be. Be scriptural, I mean, be, be spiritual. Oh, I'm a spiritual person. I forgive. I love my enemy. And uh, further than that, oh, I do this because I have the nature of my father. I belong to him. I act like him. I live like him. I so on, so on. Which is good. But hardly anybody explain why, how you love your enemy. To love your enemy is not wrongly love them, just handing them a weapon. Your enemy come to destroy your family and love them. They're trying to break down to your house. You unlock the door. And then the Bible says, love your enemy. Somebody trying to break into our house to destroy our family, uh, trying to crawl through the window. You say, no, don't do that. I open the front door or the back door. I put my dog away. I put my gun away. And you come and do whatever you want to do to my family, to my spouse, to my kid. Isn't that kind of love your enemy? Wrong. Some people love the enemy that way. The enemy come to destroy us, destroy our family, destroy our loved one, and instead of protecting one another, you hand the key, the weapon to the enemy to come to destroy your family completely. They call it betrayal. This is not how God say love your enemy. Loving your enemy here in this context, it's clearly say love your enemies and pray for them. To love the enemy in the right context is to pray for them. What does it mean, pray for them so they have more weapons to destroy us? So they have more strength? No, to pray for them that God will have mercy and change and, and convert that person so that person not only 
Stop doing what is evil, but save that soul. Pray for them that they can be converted, not love them so that you encourage them to do whatever they want to do to you and to your family. That's not loving. That's called betraying your family. That's called loving your enemy in that context. Of course. The enemy come want to, 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 to kill your family, you hand him a knife. Uh, I can't help but the story that I grew up in literature talking about a king, a prince to be a king, and on the way back from his education, he got this bride. You know, all, all not real, okay? Don't say that I'm preaching to but just illustration. This prince with the new princess, newly wed and um, coming homecoming prince and princess to get the throne. And on the way, as a rough and tough and evil, you know, it's called a bad boy. And this beautiful princess and stuff and gentle, look at her newly husband. Say, I like the bad boy. And then the bad boy, of course, comes with all of this thing and start beating this prince. And this prince is like, prince, you know, kind of weak a little bit and kind of go down now. And this bad boy just, of course, he's tough and rough. He has no standard, has no mercy, no rule, no law, fighting without policy. <laughs> and then he said, honey, help me out. Hand me that sword. Of course, she handed him the sword. Yeah, honey, sword, because he's just trapped now. And the sword have a handle and a blade. And she handed him the sword, but he, she handed him the blade side of the sword. He grabbed the blade, and the handle exposed to the enemy. And the enemy grabbed the handle. She did it purposely so that she can consciously say, I, I love you, honey. I did my best. I handle you the sword. He grabbed the sword blade. The enemy grabbed the handle. And they struggle. Losing end, you know that. The blood starts oozing out to the blade of the sword, holding like this. And the guy just pulled the sword from the hand of the prince, just like from the shop. And a few seconds later, he put it back down to the heart. She loved the enemy so well to give him the sword and the handle side. Loving enemy that way is wrong. I'm sure you know the story illustration. It's Cambodian literature. You know, I'm not preaching that. It's really anything. Once upon a time only, far, far away in some galaxy. No. That's all my stuff. <clears throat> Love your enemy is to pray for your enemy so that enemy no longer evil. You know that? Evil. That person is no longer evil. Repent and change and not a beast to destroy your spouse, your loved one, your children, your parents, your family, your church. But you know better than that. You do not love your enemy that way. You love enemy, you pray for them and stay clear and ask someone, some men in your church, some, some godly people to pray for them. Not you to go and pray for them every morning, every night. Just go and pray for them and take them out and pray for them. Oh, you know. Oh, yes. After a while, you become his lunch and his dinner and his dessert. But nice now. Roman 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you and bless those who and bless and do not curse them. Wow, see? See? The Bible teaches to do that. Verse 19 and 21, not many people talk about this to say that. Never avenge yourself and leave the wrath of God. Not many people talk about that. Always bless, forgive your enemy, love your enemy, bless them, don't curse them. But how about Vengeance is mine. <laughs> it's the word vengeance is too graphic, too strong to Christian, Christianity, Christian doctrine. Nevertheless, it's there. As loving as God is to the enemy, God will revenge. The word vengeance or revenge is deadly. God say, revenge 
Vengeance is mine, I will pray, say the Lord, say the Lord, not people here. But for you, on the contrary, for you, when or if you love, your enemy is hungry, feed him, feed him. Give him this, is practically help them, but not to trust yourself or give all the secret coat and door and weapon to your enemy so they can destroy you. No, 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 just, just be merciful to your enemy. Food and drink is something simple not to destroy your family. But people stop right there. Actually, it goes further. For by so doing, by so doing, you will heap burning coal on his head. What's that mean? You do this to annoy him? No. You do this to make him receive clear mind that cause and effect, bless and curse is coming. You do evil, I do good for you so that you know that you have chance and chance and chance. You need to repent. Oh, oh vengeance is mine, say the Lord. God will curse you. See, forgiveness and loving enemy, it has to be scripturally correct. Otherwise, we mess it all up. We destroy, we dishonor God, and we elevate ourselves to be bigger than God, bigger than Jesus, bigger than the Bible. However, it's not for us not to do it. We do it, but we do it in such a way that they turn to God. You love them, you forgive them so they can turn to God. And you do not go and vengeance yourself. You let God do that. And a lot of times, we put people confused between who is your enemy, who is your family. Some Christians especially love the enemy more than love their own family. I'm talking about Christian family. I'm not talking about biological family. But if your biological family is a Christian, they are your family. Double. A lot of people confused about who is my brother. So fast to jump and to protect and to adore and to praise and to love everything possible that you can offer to the enemy because you're confused which one is your family. Matthew 18, 21 to the truth. <coughs> he talked about forgive your brother. A lot of times they say forgive whoever. Their forgiveness is free range. Forgive everybody. Forgive it whether they repent or not. Forgive them. In this context, Jesus is talking about the relationship in the family, in the church, in the relationship, in the Christianity. Yeah. My brother. The word brother is mean mean brothers and sisters in the Lord here. It's not a brothers and sister biologically. Some people, many people who so called religious, so big on go everywhere. Celebration, party, religious activity outside their circle because they those are their brothers. That's sad to say, but they are doing that. And I cannot say enough. That it is is sinful. Who are your brothers? Who are your family? Right? Jesus clearly answered that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 48 and 50. When his mother and his biological brothers and sisters came to ask for Jesus, Jesus, we're waiting outside. What are you doing? Taking too long. And Jesus said, Behold, he stretched out his hand. Behold, here are my brothers and sisters and mothers. These are my family. You mean he's rude? He's so disrespectful to his biological family? No, he's not. He didn't say, those are not my family. He didn't say that either. But he said that, more important, you are my family. The one who is my true family are, verse 50, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is, I would say truly, is my brother and sister and mother. So your family is not necessarily biological family, can be if they are doing the will of God, but your family, your close-knit, is the one that does the will of God. Those are the people Jesus talked about. Forgive them. Love them. Prioritize. They are the most important to you, not the people outside, not the people who lure you with some carrot. People you hang out, you have fun with people, this benefit your flesh. No, no. 
Get it right, get it straight, children, people. You will be so sorry if you don't do this. Luke chapter 8, verse 21. Jesus said about his family, who are the real family, those who hear the word of God and those who obey the word of God. Those are the people he qualified the most important to himself and to us too. People who does the will of God People who listen, obey the word of God, and people who practice it. Never just hear, but practice it. So we are to do this. Pay close attention that we will not mess up. Careful, because it could be deadly, could be idolatry, could be man-made religion, could be self-centered doctrine, and most important, could be dishonoring God. Pay attention to the scripture, Luke 17. Three to four. He said, pay attention to yourself. Listen up. Important. But even if he didn't say that, he said, start saying whatever. It's still, still important. Most important is from Jesus. But how much more? You understand that? How much more when he say, pay attention? We ought to pay attention. We should pay attention. We must pay attention either way when God speaks. Yes. Much more when he say, pay attention. If your brother sins, right? You're supposed to forgive him. Of course, we understand the forgiveness. But there's something you need to understand. When your brother sins against him, you must rebuke him or her. You must correct him. You must discipline him or her. One. Two. If she or he repents. See? Conditional clause here, independent clause here. If, if, that means if not, the result is not. If he repents, forgive him. Forgive him. This also say, you can interpret that clearly, what about if he doesn't repent? Forgive him not. Forgive him not. Otherwise, it wouldn't be if he repents. We we'll say, pay close attention. If your brother sin against you, rebuke, rebuke him. Repent or not, forgive him. That is man-centered doctrine, idolatry. We create our own religion now. And verse 4, even if I come to you seven times a day, say, I repent sincerely here, not Oh, then he repent. He take advantage of me. I'm not talking about taking advantage. We're talking about sincerely. A person trap, person try hard. Sincerely, sincerely work out, work hard to get out. I repent. You must forgive him. You must forgive him. However, forgiveness, like I said earlier, and repentance go together. Let me give you an illustration, and then we close here. Unfortunately, we have to close here. I have. I'm sad that we have to close it, but I'm, I'm happy, too, because um, uh, we get a lot of things done, too. Time's up. Repentance must be twin with forgiveness. Forgiveness without repentance is not scriptural, it's not biblical, and we'll see more next week. But I'm going to see one only. Clearly teaching from the Bible and clearly coming from the, the mouth of the loving person ever could be love. The most emblem of love, Jesus himself. The one who loves sinner, the one who died for sinner, the one who forgives sinner, but in this condition. He so says, isn't it God love us unconditionally? Yes, unconditionally, but unconditionally in this condition. Does that mean it's a contradiction in them? It's not. It's not. Unconditionally in this condition, though this condition is conditioned, but he loved them unconditionally. Okay. I'm not teaching philosophy. Matthew 18, from the lip of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15 to 17, which is a few verses before Matthew 18, 21, 22, which today we studied this for the last few months in the past. Our Lord Jesus said, If <clears throat> or when or sins or if, I mean, if your brother sins against you, because what? Go and deal with the person between you and them. Tell them. Rebuke them. If he listens to you. 
The word listen is here, pay attention. I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, tell me what I did wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you're done yet. So, okay, bye. It's not that. The context is, listen to you mean acknowledge and obey and repent. Sorry, I'm sorry I'm wrong. You have gained your brother. And then you talk about brother, we just explained that. But verse 16, clearly the context here, if he does not listen, because he put headphone on. (laughs) Yeah, that's why um, some of you, you know what I'm talking about. If we discipline you, we ask you to do something, and you go and do it, and you're so annoying, you're so angry, you want to shut up the world, you just put your headphone on, you just finish whatever you do, not playing drum. And then that attitude is as if you spit on my face. I'm talking about my children. That attitude to God, you spit in God's face. And be careful when you do that. Okay? Because judgment will come down to you. It's not because you do or you don't, it's because your attitude. It's not about listening, hearing, but some of you. Literally cut out the listening because you are annoying. Not to say that you cannot enjoy music. No, I'm not against that. But I'm, I'm against the sweet spirit to repent and to be genuine, to be free from anger and bitter and sin. I want you to be free. Free. Let's have a nice day. Let us have a good, sincere, sweet Happy day! After all, happy Father's Day, Dad. No, I'm not saying my children are evil to me or anything like that, but I'm talking about let us be real. If your brother listens to you, you got it. But if your brother does not listen to you, you know what happened with 16. You know what happened with 17. If he refused to listen, and then 17 again, and if he refused to listen three times now, Guess what happened? Excommunication. Not execution. Excommunication. Cast them out. Treat them as Gentile and tax collector. We talked about this already. Gentile and tax collector literally mean sinner, criminal, betrayal. Kick them out. Openly. Openly, publicly, announced to the church. So and so, beyond repair. Kick him out. You cannot, we cannot, we must not, we must not forgive someone who does not repent. But it doesn't mean we hate them, but we must love them. We cannot love them by handing them the sword with a handle on the side. We must love them correctly, pray for them. Keep on burning the coal, fine coal on their head so they can repent. Result, not only they stop bothering us, but they save, they get their soul saved by God, forgiving them because they repent. That's what is forgiveness is about. Forgiveness must go with repentance. We must forgive the same way as God teaches us. At the same time. Why we talk about forgiveness? So much because the Bible says so, right? But at the same time, I want to flip the table, turn the table around. A lot of time we don't need to forgive because we are in the position not to not to forgive anybody. We are the we are in the position to be forgiven. We are the wrong. We are the sin against God, against one another, against Holy Scripture. We are the one who need to repent. So I want to highlight repentance. We may be the one. Who not worry about forgiveness, but worry about more repentance today. Let us repent from our sin. I not preaching at you. I'm preaching at sins and us and myself that yes, we need to forgive, we need to love the right way, all of that good. We cannot make up our own religion, Jesus of forgive, forgive. Cambodian verse, oh, fight for ang. Meaning, give it to God. I don't know. I just forgive. I'm better than God. If God doesn't forgive you, I forgive you. And not that wrong. Forgive those who God forgive. Forgive those who repent to God. Forgive those who repent to us. If they're wrong. All that, clear. But most important, we are 
the person, the people who need to be forgiven from God and from others. Therefore, we need to repent to God. We need to repent to one another. And this is the deep secret. The wisdom from God, the Holy Spirit, and the Scripture to you, to me, today. May God be honored from all of this teaching, listening, hearing, and doing it. Let us live a life to practice, to honor God. Let us live a life that we can be free from guilt, from sin, from pain, from fear. Let us live a life of truly a blessed and joyful life. Let us live the life, a life that more than be happy, blessed, and joy, but a life that have the opportunity and freedom and privilege to honor our Father who is in heaven, who forgives sinners, who repents of him. May the, Lord, may the Lord be honored today because of not only listening and understanding this, but go out and live so. Pastor Dave, I should stop here. Okay, brother. It's empty. I would just say amen to that, and uh, I, I love it. Um, not some clever 14 steps towards forgiveness or anything like that, but from what I see that Pastor Adam just gave us two uh, steps, two truths, uh, what true forgiveness is, and, and that is to, number one, to understand both in our minds and in our hearts as we walk it out what true forgiveness is from God, and two, to, to forgive in that way only. And so we want to ask God to help us to seal these things in our hearts, to uh, make it so that it's not just things that, that we know, that if somebody quizzed us, we can give an answer to, but something that is truly part of who we are because we ourselves have truly repented and we ourselves have truly received forgiveness of sins. So with that in mind, why don't we go ahead and, and close together. I'll uh, pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, what a joy it is to be able to fellowship with others. Uh, Lord, what a joy it is to be able to sing to you and to, to honor you with the study of your word. But Lord, most of all, it's just such an honor to, to be able to be in a relationship with you where we have forgiveness of sins, where we uh, stop seeking to glorify ourselves and then we have the privilege and joy to, to give you the glory. Lord, we thank you for the church, your precious church that you purchased with your blood. Lord, we don't want to do anything that dishonors you and in the way that we live our own lives and in the way that we relate to others in the church. Lord, we ask that you would help us to see things clearly. There's so many uh, just different voices out there in the world and even in churches that would say that, that forgiveness is just something that you just kind of say to, to anybody and there's nothing needs to be done and Lord you have shown us in your word that that forgiveness and repentance are always there together that there is no forgiveness without repentance and for us to to turn and to just to say oh that's that's okay uh, if somebody seeks us out or for us to expect that from somebody else when we uh, seek out their forgiveness, um, or even if there is no forgiveness that's being sought out, is idolatry. It's not just a bad idea. It's not just a little bit off, but that it, it is worshiping what is created rather than worshiping you because it's, it's worshiping our own ideas, what we think is best rather than what, what you say is best. Lord, we don't want to give people a false idea of what true forgiveness is. We don't want to give people a false idea of what true repentance is. We want always, Lord, to use every opportunity to direct others to you. And, Lord, so if we have uh, somebody seeking us out to, to receive forgiveness, Lord, may we seize that opportunity to point them in the direction of you who they have sinned against ultimately and direct them to, to seek 
you out in repentance, in true repentance. And Lord, may we in our own hearts seek out you in, in, with hearts that are turned away from our own sin and, and truly seek after you for the forgiveness that you freely give. And as we do this, Lord, I pray that you would train us up to offer forgiveness in that way, that for those who are truly repentant, that we would extend forgiveness, Lord, because it has been extended by you. And Lord, whatever offenses that have done, been done against us, Lord, even those things that in the flesh would be hard for us to forgive, Lord, may we forgive those things again and again to those who are truly repentant. And in that, Lord, we are a faulty and frail picture of, of your grace. Help us to be gracious like that. Help us to forgive. Help us to repent. And help us to lead others to repentance. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have in you. Uh, please be with us as we go throughout our week this week. That we would honor you in everything that we say and in everything that we do. In the way that we use our time and in the very attitudes of our hearts. We pray that you would honor yourself through us and help us as a church to walk in complete faithfulness in this. We pray, pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May, be God, may God be glorified in our forgiveness of others, and may God be glorified in us as we repent and he forgives us.